So I don't know um, how micromanagement you are with your newsletter, but the XR lab signed up for your newsletter yesterday. So. Yeah, I'm not that micromanaged. <laughs> I, I don't know when people sign up or don't sign up. I don't keep track of who's following it. Okay. Uh, yeah. I know that's exactly the opposite of what I'm supposed to be doing. I should have metrics and be able to show value add, but uh, I can't. Because it just doesn't matter enough to me. Um, what's important to me is, I don't know, just doing the newsletter. That sounds and great. Sharing it, and I don't need to extract value from the people who follow it. It's not really necessary. I'm just going to take my door here. Oh, I'm going to grab coffee. I'll be right back. Okay. But I'll still be able to hear you. So if you have anything else. Okay. So James, just a quick note to you: if you could uh, do the recording with uh, uh, Stephen Spotlit. Um, cause I've, uh, anyway, just to let you know, if you have him spotlit as full screen, that would be great. Are you able to do that? Yeah. You just highlight as, uh, you, you highlight the person. Okay. Hey, I'm right. going to ask uh, him a technical question. Okay. So big in this. All right. I am ready. All right, we're back. We're back. And Stephen, do you know that your camera is off? Yeah. Just making sure that's intentional or not. It's not. Uh, hmm. Are you running through OBS or something like that? That maybe there's something. I am running OBS, but my camera should have been on in the uh, Zoom before I started OBS. Well, well, it was on. Um, I mean, well, we, we waved you and everything. Uh, yeah, it might have taken it over. I wonder. I'm just do you, anyways, uh, we could potentially stop sharing screen and just have you viewable. And then when you start sharing screen, then we can go back to this. Um, but that's up to you. So we can give that a quick test now if you want. Um, let's see. Oops, that didn't work. I'm just trying something quickly, which might solve the problem for us. And then to add to the underlying Zoom life here, we'll have the, the beeping, I guess. We, we still, we haven't been able to figure out how to turn off the beeping. It can't be that hard, but we weren't able to figure that out the last time. So you might hear occasional beeping you, as people join. Steven just showed up, so that's good. Okay. There's Steven. Hi, Steven. Hello. <laughs> All right. Good. Okay, I'm going to stop share so that you can do your thing at the start, and then I'll start sharing when I start doing my presentation. All right. And I'll... I hope people are able to see Amy. I'm not seeing Shelby at the moment, but I hope they're able to see even when they're minimized. Great. And Bruce, you had said there's a ton of people in the waiting room. We have about 28 now in the room, uh, in, in the meeting. I'm still letting uh, them in as they're coming in. So oh, okay. We're we just, just taking a while to get everybody in. Okay. Got it. Cool. Too bad there isn't some way of mass letting people in. There, there is actually, if you go to, um, it, Bruce, if you want to go to part, I think there's a way to go to participants. Oh, and I'm there. I, I'm, turn off I'm, the waiting room. I, I'm there and I'm letting people in as they come in. Right. But there I think you could just turn off waiting room and they just poof, come in. Oh, I see. Okay. I think there's a way to there do that. I've Dr. done that before. Bain. Good to see you. Thank you for showing up. Yeah. It looks like you got a great spot in the sun, which ha we haven't had sun over here, Stephen, in uh, at least two weeks or something. So. Oh, <laughs> you have my sympathy. <laughs> Vitamin D while I can. Yeah. 
<laughs> but not that much sympathy because I know you're on the West Coast and I'm over on the East and we suffer rather more in terms of weather than you do. <laughs> I'm just saying. So Bruce, let me know when uh, you feel like we have enough people in here that we can start. Uh, I'm just watching the numbers go up, but I don't know how many people we're waiting right. for. We're, we're ready to go and we have automatic and uh, it's automatically set for people to join when they arrive. Oh, okay. okay I'm, I'm, you're going to do an introduction, aren't you, Robin? I am going to do an introduction, yeah. And just ask Bruce to spotlight your video while you do your introduction. <laughs> hey, Bruce, do you feel like spotlighting me while I do my introduction? Yeah, hold on. I just realized I could have done that. So. That's okay. All right. Well, thank you for your patience, everyone, as we're getting ready here. Um, as Bruce is starting to spotlight me, which isn't terribly important because I'm only going to be on the screen for about 50 seconds. Um, but uh, so if it's any trouble, Bruce, don't worry about it. Uh, I'm just camera's not on and my camera's not on that would that probably doesn't help okay um so a quick note about today's session uh is that it will be recorded and we'll start the recording in about uh, about 30 seconds and we are also pleased to have a sign language interpreter at today's session and the interpreters with us today are shelby and amy thank you for um being here Hello and welcome to the second session of our Bellevue College eLearning and XR Lab Symposium. My name is Ron Austin and I work here at the college. I work in eLearning and at the XR Lab. And I'm here to introduce our guest speaker for today's AI Symposium, Stephen Downs. Stephen Downs is an educator. He's a philosopher. He's a specialist in online learning technology and new media. And I think all of you have heard of MOOCs, Massive Open Online Course. And you are an originator. I don't know if you're on the first one or not, Stephen, but you're definitely up there. It looks like the first one. And um, you are a proponent, a proponent of connectivism, which I think you originated or co-originated as well. Um, and wow. and um, and uh, I'm quote. I'm going to quote from your website now. Uh, it's a theory describing how people know and learn using network processes. Hence, uh, Stephen has also published in the areas of logic and reasoning, 21st century skills, and critical literacies. Um, Stephen is also a leading voice in the open education movement and is a researcher at the National Research Council of Canada. So I'm sure you all understand my enthusiasm when I reached out to Stephen and you replied and you accepted our invitation. Thank you. And it's my great honor to introduce you here, Stephen Downs, and thanks for being here. And I'm going to hand over the microphone to you. Thanks a lot, Ron. It's a pleasure to be here. Hi, everybody in Seattle. And uh, oh, let me just start this and this. OK, so we're, we're live in Seattle. We're also live streaming on YouTube. And of course, there's a recorder on. So um, don't say anything you'll regret later. Uh, I can also see the chat. So if you have access to chat where you are, uh, feel free to chat. And uh, you know, as they come up, uh, I will reply to them completely at my own whim, of course. Um, today's topic is navigating the AI revolution. Um, that's the name of the conference as a whole or the event as a whole. And my particular contribution is titled uh, loosely Education at the Crossroads, Technologies, Values, and the Role of the Institution. I'm going to touch on all of those things today. Uh, a little procedural note as well. Um, this presentation is available online. Uh, this website should work, www.downs, that's D-O-W-N-E-S, dot C-A, slash presentation, slash 569. So if you want to follow along with the slides at home or you want to keep the slides at home, uh, please feel free. 
download them, fold them, spindle them, mutilate them, do whatever you want with them. Uh, they're for you. So uh, navigating the AI revolution. So let's put this into context right off the bat. Oh, and I've lost my chat. Where did that go? There we go. That's better. <laughs> uh, yeah, everything changes when you share your screen. So let's get to the issue right away. Um, we're, we're talking most of all today, overall, about artificial intelligence. And that's where the focus of my talk will be. Now, before this year, the range of artificial intelligence was fairly narrow you know, comparatively speaking. Uh, it could be used to describe things, could be used to diagnose or classify things. It could be used in some cases to predict things, like, for example, whether or not a person would pass a course if they kept doing what they're doing. And it could even, in some, case, some cases, prescribe solutions. This year, last year and this year, we've seen an explosion of what can be called generative artificial intelligence. And I'll talk about that uh, through the presentation as we go. And in the future, and I won't talk about this again, so I'll just say it now and then we'll forget about it, but don't forget about it. Uh, artificial intelligence will be able to perform what I call deontic analytics, that is, it will determine not just will be the case, not just what is the case, but what should be the case. So this is a challenge for educational institutions, right from kindergarten all the way up through colleges and universities, because especially creating and talking about values, that's the domain of education. That's the thing that we do as educators. And so we're faced with a very specific challenge. What do we do when everything we do and everything we teach people to do can be done by artificial intelligence? Now, probably right off the bat, some of you are thinking, oh, no, there's AI can't do this, AI can't do that. Hang on to that if you want, but I wouldn't count on it. Um, the rate that AI is going, it will be very easily capable of doing almost unimaginable things. You know, wasn't even last year when people were saying, oh, AI can't be creative. Well, we've learned it can be creative. Um, here's the response that this presentation gets around to. This is the TLDR version. Oh, that stands for too long, didn't read. It's not what we do for our students. It's not going to be even about what we teach them, what we have to say to them. It's much more about what we help students to do for themselves. And I see my slides have done a little creative capitalization on me. That's AI does that sometimes. Oh, I should say all of these slides and this entire presentation has been 100% created by a human, except for the examples of things that were created by AI, which I will flag. Just a few months ago, I didn't have to say that, but now I have to say that. So I talked about generative analytics and that's the challenge for today. That's the challenge for this year. Um, generative analytics have been actually around for a few years. They've really become uh, front and center this year. But as we'll see shortly, they've been around for the last five or six years, and they've been getting better and better and better. And the stuff that we've seen with, for example, chat GPT is just the latest in a series of progressively better AIs. And this is going to continue. There will be more and more of these announcements and these incredible tools um, coming through the rest of this year, into next year, and so on. I don't know when it'll stop, to be frank. 
So generative analytics, there's a few different types. It doesn't matter um, what the types are. It doesn't matter what their name. Just keep in mind there are different companies producing different versions of them. All the big companies are in on it. Facebook or Meta, uh, Microsoft, Google, etc. cetera. Uh, and I've highlighted five major areas, images, music, software, text, and finally, research and education. Now, let's look at a little bit of this. Um, because again, I think I'm, I'm maybe speaking to some skeptics who don't think AI can do all of this stuff. Well, if we look here, uh, way down in this uh, lower right-hand corner, that's from 2015, a product called Google Deep Dream. And what it did is it would try to find images of cats or dogs or whatever in art. And you can see here, it's finding all kinds of animals in Van Gogh's The Starry Sky. Um, 2019, a big fuss around something called This Person Doesn't Exist. Um, where the AI just churned out hundreds, hundreds, thousands, and thousands of pictures of people, convincing pictures of people who don't exist. They're just composite images. Um, last year, we had a couple, GPT-3 and DALI, uh, producing images based on text prompts. And so we got a whole range of wild and super creative images. There's been a lot of discussion about that. But it's not just images. There's also AI-generated music. Uh, I have a few examples for you. Um, here's one. Uh, uh, this is artificial intelligence-generated metal. I one before. I thought less. Hell yeah! Sorry. Hours to get viewers. You were obvious. Nothing like some good hair metal. Dude, this is just like actual. Or for those of you of a different persuasion. They all can know it's gonna be all right. Let the darkness fade away. I love that stuff. I could go on. There's been progressively more and more innovative AI generated music. And uh, among the things that have come out recently are endless feeds of AI generated music. So uh, it's it doesn't repeat. It doesn't do the same thing over and over again. It's just continuously generating original and new music. Uh, which is a boon for people like me who create things like biking videos and don't have any money to pay royalties for biking video background music. But it's not just music. Artificial intelligence also writes software. Um, re released just last year was something called GitHub Copilot. Uh, GitHub is owned by Microsoft. Um, and the co-pilot uh, is accessible inside the Microsoft uh, Visual Studio Code software that numerous, probably a majority of developers use to write computer code. And it's really like having a coding programmer. You type in a few words that tell it what you want to do, you know, like uh, connect to such and such an API or open such and such a file. and the AI just writes the code for you, saving you all that effort. Um, but these efforts go back, you know, as far back as 2016 with Wix ADI, uh, which produces websites or, uh, you know, more recent versions. There have been a ton of products come out. For example, Durable is also uh, an AI website creator. But it's not just software. This year was the year of AI generated text. Although again, this has been around for a while. In fact, in 2016, 
it was revealed, because they weren't really telling anyone, that Associated Press was using artificial intelligence to write baseball stories, well, sports stories generally. And a large number of publications, both online and offline, have been using AI to write articles, and all along we didn't even notice. Uh, Jasper is an application that people can use to write their own content, so we're about to be flooded with a pile of AI-generated blogs. Um, ChatGPT is an AI that will work with you, have a conversation back and forth, and help you generate original content. Um, you know, you can ask it questions, you can give it writing prompts, it'll do the rest. Uh, Grammarly, which has been around for a while, also uses artificial intelligence to help you write better, you know, to write in a more grammatical way. I had it, but I turned it off because I don't need it. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and it's expensive. That's mainly why I turned it off. Finally, research and education, and this is what's going to impact us the most. Um, for example, artificially generated immersive environments. Check that out. This is artificially generated. Uh, so, you know, we don't need to build these complex VR worlds. There is no sound with that video. Um, we can just have an AI build the world for us. Um, as well, there's the open AI playground uh, that students were using to write their papers. So there is, of course, now a war between AI student essay generators and AI detecting student essay plagiarism checkers. Um, but it can be used on the other side as well. There is, uh, for example, at lessonplans.ai, a pretty good AI system that creates lesson plans for you. And I've seen a, a number of these and they are pretty good. I could spend the rest of the presentation doing these. Um, we're we're uh, up to our ears now in generative AI applications. These applications are doing just about everything we can think of. Now, yeah, um, you've probably read, generally in the traditional press, about how bad some of these AI generated uh, pieces of content are. And yeah, it's, it could be better for sure. Uh, yeah, it, it can pass a law school exam, uh, but it can't calculate basic fractions, uh, things like that. So there's a ways for it to go. It's not there yet. Uh, it's a fun tool to play around with, to create first drafts with, but you shouldn't be uh, writing medical recommendations or scientific papers using it. Not yet, at least. Give it a couple of years. Oops. So let's talk about artificial intelligence a little bit um, because there's a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of confusion or just a lot of, well, I don't know how it works, about AI. So uh, you can look at the detailed description. I've provided a link for you, but uh, really AI is a three or four step kind of thing. And I've, I've characterized it that way here in this slide. On the left-hand side here, we have data. I will talk a lot more about data, but you have data. That's the input. That data is fed into and helps create what we call data models. I'll talk about those based on algorithms. These algorithms are then applied in an AI application to produce some kind of output. Uh, I know that sounds all very general, but, but we'll look at that in a little bit more detail. So, but I, I first want to sort out the misconception and uh, for the interpreter, I'm really sorry about this slide. <laughs> it's from Microsoft. And I saw the look of confusion on your face as soon as you saw it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, in the world of artificial intelligence, there are 
basically two major branches. On the one hand, we have what is called good old fashioned AI, GoFi. And then on the other hand, we have neural networks and deep learning. These are very different. Most people, when they think of AI, think in terms of GoFi, good old fashioned AI. They think about knowledge representation. They think about taxonomies or ontologies, expert systems, rules and programs and instructions um, and algorithms, you know, like a computer program, like Microsoft Word or, or your favorite game or something like that, you know, where it's just a series of instructions working on structured data. That's old fashioned. That's what AI used to be. That's what we thought knowledge was. And if you still think knowledge is that, you should be questioning that as well. That's what we thought knowledge was, but not anymore. At least you shouldn't be. Uh, Ron mentioned connectivism. Well, at the core of connectivism is the rejection of this old fashioned picture and the embrace of the new picture, which is neural networks and deep learning. I've talked about connectivism. Um, knowledge is the organization of connections in a network. And learning is the creation or manipulation of those connections in a neural network or in a network. Any network will do. Um, and that's what deep learning is. That's what neural networks are. Think of it as like a brain, a human brain, where you have individual neurons that are all connected to each other. There are no sentences. There are no taxonomies. There are no words. And you open up a human brain, you will not find one word. You will find a bunch of neurons connected to each other. And that's what modern artificial intelligence systems look like, too. And they have fancy names like GAN or convolutional networks or NLP, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we'll talk briefly about that. But the main thing to understand is it's not rules, it's not representations, it's not functions or algorithms or instructions. That makes it really tricky and it makes understanding some of the values associated with it and what we can do with it a bit difficult to comprehend. Neural networks work essentially through a process of pattern recognition. This is actually something that we're pretty familiar with. Already looking at that picture, you should be recognizing a pattern. Do you recognize the pattern? I've only given you a partial representation of it, but you should see it. Yeah, that's the cookie monster down there. Oh, me so glad you picked me. There's so many things for us to eat. Uh, I mean, see, to see. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you'd like to play Cookie's Cookie Cookie Game, click on the Go Light. Round one. Welcome to me, Cookie Cookie Game. Sorry this about the Korean very captions. Exciting game. Watch this and me show you how we play. <coughs> See the cookies? They so beautiful. They in a special line. Go together just right. Wait, 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 wait. One cookie missing. Move star to extra cookies up there to choose which one it is. So which one is it? Okay, you're all saying, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> this, uh, Frank is asking, isn't AI smart enough to know what language to caption? Uh, no, because they didn't use AI there. They just actually, anytime you create a video, as the video author, you have to 
manually select the captioning language. And so the person who uploaded this video manually selected Korean and it overrides what I want. So how annoying, eh? Anyhow, yeah. So what's the correct thing? Well, again, we're doing pattern recognition here, just like an AI would do. So we're probably all going to select the round green cookie. Um, but what if you choose the yellow cookie? See, this is where things get really interesting with pattern matching. Um, you might say, well, suppose I said, I want to pick the yellow cookie. Your response might be, well, yeah, but it should be the green cookie because we've got, a, you know, the colors in a pattern here. But what if I'm colored one? Or what if I simply say the color doesn't matter? Why do we think the color matters? You see, when we're explaining our selection here, it gets tricky because the explanation often embodies or includes background assumptions, contextual factors, and the rest. In a fully fledged AI system, all of those are already part of the system, and it's really difficult to figure out what they are and, and how they apply to whatever it is that the AI is recognizing. We can think like an AI, though. Is. Let's play the prediction game. Follow along with me. Mary had a little... Right. Wow. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Or how about there's no place like um. exactly. Oh say can you see. Yep. That's that's for my American friends who I'm talking to here today. <laughs> Luke, I am your father. 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 And now just one that's a little more open ended. Trust. No one. <laughs> Very good. My brain says trust Texaco. You might not even know what Texaco. Yeah, you must know what Texaco is. Uh, it's an old gas station. And that used to be their slogan. And it was on TV. And it was drummed into our heads over and over and over again. Trust Texaco. But now, yeah, trust no one. Interesting. But that's what AI does. That's what these large language models do, right? They're looking at patterns in the text. Why do we predict Mary had a little lamb? Because in virtually all previous instances where we heard the words Mary had a little, it was followed with lamb. So we're just recognizing that as a pattern. I put a link down there to a presentation called Speaking in Lolcats. Um, and I have a very old uh, work also called Hacking Memes. Lolcats, online memes, all of these things are based on pattern recognition. It's almost like it's an anti-culture, it's an anti-rules-based kind of thing and totally recognition-based kind of thing. There's a whole lot to say about that, but I can't talk about it right now. So you can play the prediction game for yourself. I put a link here in this slide. And if we go to the prediction game, so it just it gives you a word to start with. In this case, it started with eight. So what will I type? Let's try monkeys. That's because I'm thinking 12 monkeys, but because it's a number. So, oh, I have to get a new, okay. Ryan, what follows Ryan? Let's go with Seacrest. Okay, let's try that. Oh, it's not a valid token. Okay, let's try was. Oh, Ryan Air must be a British name. <laughs> um, failed. No, Ryan Air boss. Okay, who's the Ryan Air boss? I don't know. Anyhow, you, you get the idea. Yeah, it is an airline, Ryanair. And uh, so Ryan was failed today. So anyhow, and you can go on and on. Here's one with it filled out. This is what 
these language models are doing. This is what chat GPT is doing. And it's important to understand that uh, it doesn't actually have any knowledge other than pre-existing sequences of words. And the other AIs, even the music AI works the same way, right? Has these pre-existing sequences of words and then it comes up with the next one and the next one and the next one. And the generative AI uh, applications are iterations on that concept. Uh, what it doesn't have, for example, is things like mathematical facts or knowledge of world geography or access to online publications and reference works, things like that. And this is why when you look at modern AI or this year's version of AI, it feels really familiar. It feels like it's saying exactly what you would expect it to say about something. And that's because it is literally saying exactly what you would expect it to say about something. But it's unreliable, just like a lot of people, um, because it doesn't have access to the facts of the matter. So that's going to create some issues for us. So when we're looking at these applications uh, as practitioners and as educators and eventually as users on a day-to-day -day basis, there are questions that we're going to have to ask. Questions like, what is the model that we are going to select? If you look at the right here, this image shows a small subset of the different types of neural network topographies or configurations that are available. Why would you choose this big green one here rather than this little purple circle down here? Each of them has different characteristics. Some of them remember better over time. Others are easier to trigger. Uh, they're more sensitive. Um, others take into account longer or shorter sequences of data, etc. Um, others feed the results that they've just generated back into the front. Um, others are based on competition, where it sets up two alternatives and sets them against each other. Why pick one rather than the other? It's a hard question to ask. Once we've picked a model, how do we explain why the model produced the result that it did? Now, if we were working in terms of rules and representations and sentences and things like that, we could come up with a decision tree, like the one pictured here, and say, well, we made this decision because such and such. We made this decision because such and such. And there would be a good explanation of each factor that we took into account in our decision. But a neural network makes that very difficult. A neural network won't take into account 5, 10, 15 factors. It'll take into account 5, 10, 15,000 factors. What was the crucial factor? Or what was the specially right factor? It's almost, well, it is literally impossible to tell. We need different mechanisms of explaining why an AI made the decision it did. There's a good paper that I just put in my newsletter today um, in InfoQ on AI interpretability models. In other words, different ways of interpreting AI. Uh, here's another question. Can you appeal a decision made by an AI? Or who is accountable for the decisions made by an AI? This raises the question of AI agency. Uh, you know, more and more, they're acquiring the capabilities that people have and are often acting as an agent for people. I was on a, a committee not too long ago, an IEEE committee, where there was a certain number of people arguing that uh, autonomous agents are literally making their own decisions. They're autonomous. And therefore, the AI should be held responsible and say, not the person who created it or not the person who's using it. That's not something that I accept. 
And I don't think it's something that society will accept. We've had judges saying, for example, that uh, an AI cannot be considered an innovator or a patent holder under US patent law. People have tried to list AIs like ChatGPT as authors in scientific research papers, but journals are coming back and saying, no, you can't list them as an author. You have to describe it as a tool. You know, but as these systems become more and more capable, it's going to be harder and harder for us to push back. You know, there's an expression, human in the loop, that people like to use to talk about the way that there should always be a human we can appeal to um, when an AI makes a decision. But eventually we may come to trust the AI more than we trust the person. And it will get harder and harder for a person to be able to explain why they have overruled the determination of the AI an ethical issue that we're going to be looking at. Now, the crossroads for institutions center around ethics and values. We can think of things like inclusion, sustainability, ethics as key values, but there are other themes, there are other values, autonomy, individual autonomy, agency, community values, openness, care and respect, value and benefit, etc. I did a study of ethical codes, and there's no single set of values that everybody agrees on. And we're going to need to learn how to navigate in a world where we need our AI to be value-driven, because we don't want unethical AI, but in a world where we don't agree on what constitutes ethical. Um, we can at least address this, begin to address this with what might be called the AI values chain. Um, I was going to call it the AI value chain, but I decided to add an S to it and coin a new expression. Uh, again, going back to how AI works, we have objects, the world out there, which produces data that we've talked about, that gets fed into this application as the source of the patterns that it can recognize. And a large range of ethical issues come up with each of these three things. Let's take the first uh, persistent objects. Um, whoops, the, the objects of the AI values chain. What we want is persistence of objects. You know, we, we want to be talking about a real world where things exist and continue to exist. So for example, if I share a, a, a photograph, I can say it's the same photograph I'm sharing with you now that I'm sharing with you later. Or if a person writes a paper, it's the same person that we're talking about now as the person that we're talking about later when we give them credit, et cetera. In other words, we need persistence. We need objects that stick around. Now, a lot of people talk about the metaverse as things like virtual reality, augmented reality. And yeah, and these things have been around for a long time. But what people are really talking about when they talk about the metaverse, and it gets played down a lot, is this idea of persistent objects a world, either a virtual world or an augmentation to the real world where the objects persist from one environment to another. What sorts of objects? Well, people like us, actual physical objects. Uh, you know, these are the, the uh, non-fungible tokens that we've been talking about or things like digital credentials or certificates. Yeah, we want these to be persistent and reliable and knowably the same. That's a hard ask. Uh, in the physical world, it's easy, right? Uh, you can't easily duplicate a dollar bill. But in the digital world, it's super hard because it's very easy to duplicate a digital coin 
unless you create complex technology that prevents you from doing that. We need validity and integrity in our objects and in our people and in our system. We need, in terms of the people in the system, things like consent, universality, so that everybody is included, autonomy, so that we're not forced to do one thing or another, and ownership, so that it doesn't all belong to Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg, that we can have our own property in a digital world. How do we do this? Well, one solution that's been suggested is blockchain. Forget about financial markets and all of that stuff. Forget about coins and stuff. all of that is just the world financial markets doing what the world financial markets do, which is making bets. The really interesting technology is what underlies the blockchain, which I can talk about in three parts. Content addressing, Merkle graphs, and consensus. Don't worry about the names. The names don't really mean a whole lot. The concepts are what matters. Content addressing is just a way of recognizing a piece of content, a unique piece of content using cryptography. That allows us to prove provenance and ownership. And it's really very simple. Take a piece of content, run it through an algorithm, you get a string of characters. That string of characters is unique to that piece of content. So you can use that string of characters as an address. And you, if you're looking for some content, you just use that string of characters and say, I'm looking for the content at this address. Somebody sends you the content. How do you know it's the right content? Run that algorithm again and see if you get the right string of characters. So it's a way of locking in your content so that it can't be changed. Merkle graphs are just ways of chaining that content together. And, and that's where the chain and blockchain comes from. A Merkle graph basically takes one piece of content, adds an address to it, and puts that address in the next piece of content, and then the next, and then the next. And so what you've done is you've created a way to make sure all the content depends on all the other content. And that's important because you can't change any individual piece of content without changing the entire chain, which is very difficult and expensive to do. And blockchain made it more expensive to do it so that it's not profitable for anyone. We want this data to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Again, these are values. They're different sorts of values, but they're values. Finally, how do you know which chain is the right chain? In the world of blockchain, what they do is they use something called consensus. This is an important concept because it underlies a lot more than just blockchain. Now, usually when we think about consensus, we're thinking about, oh yeah, everybody agrees to such and such. But consensus in this world is really very limited. What it means is everybody agrees to the method that we will use to determine which is the correct chain. That's it. And then everything else is decided by the actions of the individuals involved. That means you don't need to agree uh, that grass is green. You don't need to agree that the sky is blue. All you need to agree on is that if there's a statement about the color of grass, it's located in this chain that is verified this way. That's it. So why is this important? Well, remember we were talking about artificial intelligence. Yeah. Remember how we were talking about the data that's used by artificial intelligence and how we don't, it doesn't know about objects and it doesn't know how to do mathematics or other things. Uh, and indeed, we look at something like chat GPT, which is based on 
the history of social media conversations, and we know how reliable that is, right? Not very. So there's a real issue if we feed that kind of data into an artificial intelligence. But we have these mechanisms of creating trusted data, data created by real individuals with real credentials that fits into a network or a structure of related data that satisfies the criteria. Uh, you know, it's been locked into place using Merkle chains and content addressing, and that feeds into AI. And now we have a mechanism where the values that come into play in the creation of this data now come into play in the application of AI. It's not just the values of anything goes, it's the values of how we set up this overall data and information and, and exchange and whatever network. So in untrusted data, we have the issues of data bias, misrepresentation, data access without consent, issues with inclusivity, mechanisms, something like what I've been describing are the mechanisms that will need to be developed and applied as sources of data for artificial intelligence. That's what's coming in the future. So for all of these values that I've talked about, there are different ways of approaching them. Usually when people talk about, you know, there needs to be some sort of value or another in the system of artificial intelligence, usually they're thinking about some sort of regulation. Regulations are based on fear in my mind. They're based on what might go wrong. I prefer to think about values as expressions of a culture. And I think uh, you know, uh, I have a phrase that I use from time to time, the joy of ethics. Ethics isn't about avoiding doing the wrong thing, in my mind. It's about being able to access the possibility of doing the right thing. That kind of ethics isn't based in regulation. You can't regulate that kind of ethics. But it's based partially in our practices, and I think most fully in our culture. And by culture, I'm using that term very broadly to mean all of the things that we do, that we say, that we build uh, in and among each other and society. Don't think of that as a formal definition. It's not. But you get the idea, right? Um, it's an idea of ethics that's focused on the good. It's more personal, but it's much less formal. Um, and there's a whole line of reasoning I can follow from that. But let's get back to our institutions because that's where we started, right? So what do our institutions do? Well, there's probably three major tasks, teaching and learning, research and development, innovation and growth. Now in your institution, probably are most focused on the first, less so on the second, and then depending um, on who you talk to, more so on the third. It really de depends on what you think the role of the college is. Um, these roles are all being challenged by AI and they're being challenged, not simply by the technology, but in the realm of values. These roles are changing. Uh, look at persistent objects, for example. Um, IDs, identification, plays a large role in an educational institution. Questions we have to ask are how we ensure individual autonomy and agency inside the institution. Didn't matter so much anymore, but now it does. How do we ensure diversity, equity, and inclusion in our institutions. Again, didn't matter, 
but now it does, which is why we have a sign language interpreter here, which I'm happy to see. Um, and for the record, first time one of my talks has ever been given sign language interpretation. So thank you. Uh, open educational resources, another type of persistent object. I've got a paper elsewhere where I talk about how AI can be used to create open educational resource resources that can be personalized and delivered at the time that they're needed in the place that they're needed, rather than having to write these all up ahead of time. How do we make these that they're accessible and usable? How do we support not just learning in the classroom, but lifelong learning and informal learning, learning where it's needed? Badges and credentials. What's the link between them and employability? Do they even matter anymore? Do credentials even matter anymore in a world where employers can use artificial intelligence simply to find the best employee and not worry about whether they have a degree or a certificate? What about the role of recognition in consensus networks? Does everybody get to join a consensus network and determine what will be allowed to be a fact and what will not? Or is that limited to certain groups of people? or certain people with certain credentials? These are questions we need to answer. Speaking of consensus, how do we go about building and facilitating mechanisms for people to support their own learning? You know, again, the role of simply delivering instruction doesn't work in a world where things change on an almost daily basis. And so people have to be able to adapt on the fly. And we'll come back to that point. What about building these trusted data networks that I talked about? How do we go about that? How do we access and validate the, the artificial intelligence models that we're selecting? How do we manage the workflow involved with automated resource development. Uh oh, Amy has frozen and now is turning pale green and yellow. We miss you, Amy. Um, how do we support public access to the technology? These are all questions that are close to my heart because it matters to me that the benefits of artificial intelligence and, and all the capacity that is accrued, uh, accrue not simply to one or two individuals, but to people as a whole. How do we build these consensus networks? It's a redefinition almost, a redefinition of innovation. We're not talking about how to innovate. We're, you know, we've got, machines that will do that for us now. It's a question of what do we want from innovation? And of course, there's a key role for access and inclusion. Now we're going to get to the TLDR part. All of this system that I've described, the persistent objects, the uh, blockchain networks, the AI algorithms and data. This is us. This is literally everything we say, everything we do, everything we write, everything we create up until this point. From this point on, you know, the bets are, you know, all bets are off, but this is us. Everything that this network does depends on what we do. So if we want a more ethical, a more inclusive, and a more sustainable society, then we have to make inclusive, sustainable, and ethical decisions. And it's not the sort of thing that, you know, you can just take a bunch of ethical, sustainable, and inclusive decisions and teach them to people and you're done. Now, people have to go out into the world and make these decisions on their own. And every decision they make will have an impact on what our artificial intelligence systems look like in the future. All of us need to be making these decisions. 
each individual matters in a network based on the data produced by all of us. And that's why I say it's not what we can do for our students. Our students will be out there on their own from today, from this point forward, making the decisions, doing the things that will shape the future of human society and digital society. And our role, in my mind, is to give them the best tools, the best capacities for them to be able to learn how to do it. <laughs> Bernie says, and here is indeed the real challenge. Since when has that worked recently in the greater environment? And indeed, the question is, since when have we had that? Yeah, that's the thing that AI tells us, right? Uh, you know, it's like when Microsoft first released the AI called Tay, it came back as uh, a disagreeable, virulent, and racist, offensive, and I could go on. It was awful. But it was also re a reflection of what real life is in social network. Maybe the answer to Bernie is that now we finally have a mirror. Now we can finally see what we look like as a whole. And, you know, a mirror has a, a transforming effect because where it didn't matter before, now it does matter because now you see yourself and, and you know, you, you see yourself in looking not so good. Karen says, so back to the everything important I learned in kindergarten camp is super relevant. Well, it depends on what you learned in kindergarten. Uh, but yeah, um, yeah. So that's the talk. And um, I've booked time for questions. I think there's time for questions. I think so. We ended right at, you're ending right at two and we are scheduled until 2.30. So yeah, if people, right. you know, I mean, uh, so potentially we have uh, that long for questions. So, um, And it, I'm it, here. I'm yeah, good for it. How do we want to do this? Do we want to do this just chat or unmute? There are plenty of questions in chat well. Okay. Um, so it might not hurt to start by scrolling back and having a look at some of those. Uh, Stephen's been getting some of those. Um, morals and ethics for a lifetime. For some people, though, they like for some people they like what they see in the mirror. It makes me very sad. Yeah. You know, playground. Um, you know, what's your uh well, I'm curious, just uh an obvious. Uh, topic that's been going around is the copyright issue. And um, so I enjoy creating art, I have artist friends. And so mm -hmm. there's strong feelings about the aggregation models. But um, I'm curious what your take is. Yeah, we got to be careful about that. Um, so the argument is, and it's a good argument, um, say uh, DALI, which is a, the AI image generator, uh, it gets the raw material it needs for its image from other images that are on the internet. The uh, This is not a real person image generator actually got images of real people uh, from social networks. And the argument is that, well, you know, they, they took this content and they're, you can't really say copying it because they're not producing copies of the content. But they're using that content as input for their process without permission. And so, yeah, there's a copyright. And uh, Getty Images, in fact, has just launched a big lawsuit on this. And I'm sure there will be more. But like I said, we have to be careful because, you know, these artificial intelligence, like I've said, learn from uh, neural networks. And that's the same way people learn. There's an awful lot of similarity. And when a person creates content, a piece of art, a piece of text, or whatever, uh, they don't do it from scratch, right? You know, it's not like they have a completely blank brain and then they suddenly start making things. That's not how it works, right? All of their experiences, all of the things that they've seen, etc., come into play. And that's what they use to help them create something. Um, 
And if it becomes an issue for AIs to do this, as it is, well, it will also become an issue for humans to do this. Now, if you just copy something, that's obviously plagiarism. I mean, the same thing with a human. But if you're influenced by something that you've seen and remembered, that's very different. And arguably, these AIs are influenced by things that they've seen and remembered, but they're not copying these things. So if we say, well, the AI is wrong, unethical, uh, is legal, legally liable, arguably, so are the people who do exactly the same thing. So long term, I think that uh, we're going to have to get used to the idea of the AIs learning from what we do and share in the public environment, because that's what we do as people. All right. Well, I would I would offer a rebuttal, but that's not my place to uh, <laughs> to debate you at this time. Is there another person with a question as well? So. I'm seeing Phil with a comment. Great artists don't borrow from the work right. of other artists. They steal it, <laughs> then incorporate enough right. of themselves to make it their own. We haven't, I didn't talk about this in the presentation, but right, right now, AIs really are learning only from content, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I have a joke, you know, it, it's as though AIs were taught by lecture only. And so they're not very smart. <laughs> uh, if you really want AIs to learn, just like if you really want students to learn, you need to give them some practical experience out there in the world. And AIs are going to get this. Uh, hook up an AI to, you know, cameras pointing out or traveling around the world, they're going to get all of that experience. Give an AI some sort of embodiment and let them go out and try things in the world, they'll get that experience. So, you know, that's the part of themselves that they will eventually be bringing to the things that they create. And then I see Roshni, you have a question if you want to unmute. Oh, yourself. yes. I was just wondering if they're learning from what is on the internet and we have uh, countries that hire people just to influence what's on the internet, especially in the U.S., Mm -hmm. Can they influence what is generated by different AI processes and what could be done to influence it the other way? Because now it's going to be at the battle <laughs> of the ideas. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the short answer to that is yes. Um, not only could they do it, they are no doubt doing it. Um, any algorithm that runs off social media data uh, either uh, is being influenced by these content networks, these bot networks, or has some mechanism for filtering that content out. And that's generally what they, they try to do. Right? They, they try, Twitter has an, uh, a metric, oh, I forget what they call it, um, but basically it's a metric that measures the, the actionable reads of a piece of content um, or the actionable follower, something, it's something like that. Basically, it distinguishes between uh, a reader or a response that is valuable to an advertiser because it's a person who could actually go out and buy something as opposed to uh, a reader or a responder that's not valuable because it's just a robot which can't take any of these individual actions. And so that's a very valuable metric for advertisers. And that's what matters to them. Uh, they, they want these actionable followers and not these bot followers. And probably uh, developers of AI will be doing this just in terms of their, you know, it's a part of data cleaning to filter out the, the uh, you know, not just the artificially generated content but also the content created by you know these these back rooms of, of russian hackers or whatever um can we do it the other way yeah we could we probably you know you know uh those of us in uh the western world 
you know, certainly companies and probably governments certainly have their own agents seeding their own content. I'm not sure we should be doing it. Um, you know, I, I'm not really sure it's a, an ethical way of doing things, um, but it just points to the need to be basing our artificial intelligence on much more reliable data sources than simply whatever we happen to find on social media or on websites around the world. I think that um, I'm 100% uh, on board with the data aspect of things that you've been talking about. I'm there. Um, not as much with the copyright issue because it's not an equal thing because the computers are, uh, the AI runs 24 seven and it's not human. So I don't know if the same laws and expectations should run with how we aggregate data. Um, even, but anyways, that's, that's my thinking on that one because it's like an unfair advantage if we apply the same, mm -hmm. the computer saw it and recorded it and now it's making art, it's exactly the same yeah. as if I saw it and thought of it and I'm recording art because it's, it's not the same. Um, so so that's, that's my thought about that. Um, and and um, I do have a question, uh, and then if you wanna to respond to that thought, but then I do have a question about assessment. Can I ask, can I respond to that thought first? Absolutely, thanks. Okay, uh, because here, here's the argument, right? Um, it's not the same because the AI is so much better at it than we are. You know, they might not be better at right. it in terms of skill, although they might, but certainly right. in terms of endurance and capability and speed they are. And I can't think of any previous instance where that has been good grounds for limiting competition between human and machines, except in sports. Where you're not allowed, you're not allowed to use robots as football players, for example. But, but you know, um, you know, in in terms of banking, we go with ATMs because they're so much faster and efficient. Right. Uh, in terms, of, you name it. Right. Uh, we don't have elevator operators anymore because the little buttons that we push now are so much easier and more efficient. And that's been the case throughout history. We don't have humans pulling plows or horses pulling plows. And it would be stupid, if I may say it so bluntly, to rebalance our agricultural markets so that grain produced by uh, people with horses and plows received a subsidy so that they're on even grounds with grain produced by tractors. That would make no sense. So how do you respond to that then? Because now this is going to touch all human endeavor. Maybe the whole idea that setting up our markets in terms of competition isn't the right way to go. Because now we're in a situation where we're always going to lose. And so, so maybe that's not a good strategy anymore. And that's Doc, my thinking. And Russ, Dr. Payne, you have a question? I see your hand up. Thank you, uh, and thank you, Stephen. Yeah. Bernie says, I haven't used my slide rule in decades. <laughs> <laughs> and Russ, you're on mute, I think. Um, and if you are not on that mute, better? Uh, I can hear yeah. you. Sounds great, okay, thank good. you. That's better, that's better. Well, awesome. Um, yeah, I, I might be bending the topic a little bit, but I, but I think we're kind of headed in this direction anyway. Uh, um, I have a lot of students, I teach a, a, a philosophical issues and technology class, and I have a lot of students who've gotten increasingly interested in automation and, and workers being displaced. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I'm kind of optimistically hoping that uh, this is going to lead to a reappraisal of the point of education, because I think uh, really very much in the course of my career, we, we seem to have completely capitulated on the idea of learning as an end in itself. And we're thinking of education in purely instrumental terms, how to make yourself valuable to an employer. Uh, well, uh, if the machines are soon gonna be beating the pants off us, even if we try really hard as a student, uh, uh, then we're gonna have to have it need a different reason to study. Now, of course, I expect a lot of people are just not gonna study. Uh, and, and I think that's a, a misfortune for them. Uh, uh, but, I, but I'm hoping that we get to see some revitalization of the idea that the point of getting an education is so that the student leads a more interesting life. Yeah. 
I've always questioned the whole tying of education to employment. I mean, there, there's certainly, you know, there's certainly the the utilitarian value, um, you know, particularly in a world, it, particularly in a world where you need employment to thrive. Uh, you know, we're not to the point, and may never be to the point where it's possible to thrive even if you don't have a job. Maybe one day, if machines can do everything for us, I mean, really, that ought to be the objective in the long term, right? Machines do everything for us so that we don't have to work in order to survive, and that we can lead more interesting lives. Um, you know, it, it's 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 a hard question because you know when education systems are designed around the idea of education for education's sake, then education becomes something only the rich can afford to do because the rest of us have to make a living. And we need to be a lot more practical about our knowledge and skills than that. But at the same time, we want people to be able to enjoy knowledge for the sake of knowledge. Um, you know. It's an aspiration. I think it's a social aspiration. So I'm agreeing with you and I'm disagreeing with you, right? Um, and in, in other writing, the way I address that um, is I address it through the idea that colleges and universities really need to be connected to and attuned to the interests and needs of their community. And that means more than just, you know, job, job preparation, uh, but it includes that because that's part of the needs of the community. And as these community needs shift, so should education shift. And it's not, it's not like the community dictates what education should do. And certainly not that some subset of, the community like a government or industry should dictate what education should do, neither at the university level nor at the college or community college level, nor even at the vocational institute level. Um, it should be, I don't wanna say symbiotic because that's so cliche, but, but it should be a back and forth kind of thing where education brings what it offers to the community and the community brings what it offers to education and they each learn from each other. Without this, education won't be relevant and nobody will care if we lose it. And without this, I mean, we don't stand a chance of having these lives where we can have knowledge for the sake of knowledge. So totally sympathetic to the point, it's a question of how we get there. My, if I can follow up, my, my hope is that if automation is really going to produce an abundance of leisure, then we have kind of solved the, uh, uh, the elitism worry about pursuing education for its own sake. Yeah. Um, and I, I think this is also, uh, it's coming from, I, I guess, uh, uh, other thinking about uh, uh, ethics in the very broad, value in the very broad sense of, of what it is to lead a meaningful life. Uh, and mm -hmm. And... You know, I, I, I think a, a, a thesis that you find in a number of different uh, uh, sort of philosophers, I mean, even in, in ethics, you're thinking about Kant or about the meaning of life, Irving Singer and so forth, is that, is that uh, 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 conscious experience is really the seat of value. If, if, if nobody had subjective conscious experience in the world, if there was no such mm -hmm. thing in the world, that would be a world where nothing matters. Right? So if we can use that just sort of as an intuition pump, uh, uh, to drive the idea that, that uh, uh, you know, all these things that matter instrumentally in order to achieve some other end, right? You have to have a job in order to pay mm -hmm. rent and so on and so forth. But what's the, what's the ultimate end of the road kind of value that grounds all of this? Uh, um, I'm, I'm rather attracted, I'm rather, you know, enchanted with the idea that, that the fundamental seat of value in the world is subjective conscious experience. Uh, um, and the role of education here is to enrich that, 
is to expand the boundary of, of what you can experience, mm -hmm. render you sensitive to more things, aware of more things, uh, uh, responsive to a richer realm of ideas. Um, so so I, I guess that's that's kind of the direction I'm thinking of. And I think uh, uh, when I, if I want to sort of cash out this idea of learning for its own sake, yeah. uh, uh, is that the, 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 the fundamental and intrinsic kind of value that we get to bring to the world is enriching subjective experience. I love the sentiment. Um, and like yeah, I say, it's I, an enchantment, I, not an argument here. Yeah. No, and, and it, it's certainly, I mean, Kant would say it's, it's the rational aspect of consciousness, you know, the, the capacity to actually make the decision between right and wrong. Right. Autonomy uh, is a big deal for him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, whereas a hedonist would say, well, it's pleasure is the experience that we all really want. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, different people value different aspects of experience differently. Mm -hmm. there's, there's another factor as well. Um, experience is good. Doesn't follow that more experience is better. The quality uh, matters. The quality matters. Um, and, uh, and the quantity to some degree, because even if I had, you know, um, I don't know, many persons worth of high quality experiences coming into my head all at once, as a philosopher, I can imagine these things. Um, that wouldn't be good because I, I would be able to handle it. I'd just be beyond my capacity. Um, you know, it would be like information overload, experience overload. Um, you know, and there, there are people who live their entire lives with experience overload, and, and it's very difficult for them. Uh, different people manage experience differently. But yeah, um, that seems to be, you know, overall more of a, a, a good locus of value than say the accumulation of material wealth um, or, you know, the, uh, the wielding of power, except for those who find the experience of wielding power to be exhilarating, then, then I don't know what we say about them. Um, but yeah. Uh, and the role of education, the role of education overall is going to be instrumental to a certain degree. And that's part of the, you know, it's, you know, for most of us, education is going to help us get to what it is that we really value. Um, and sometimes it's hard for educators to see it that way because what they value is education. Um, and knowledge, but but not everybody values education and knowledge. But you know what they do value. I mean, in the end, what they do value matters, and and that's the thing that we as educators need to be attuned to. I know that sounds like I'm arguing or talking in circles, but but you know, you you get into questions like artificial intelligence, and you get into these questions of value because there is the possibility of you know limitless production, and it has the advantage that nobody on Earth would have to work. And then we ask, well, is that a good thing? Is that um, an advantage? Yeah, <laughs> is that an advantage? Uh, you know, maybe we need to strive for something. The very same phenomenon managed slightly different means that two or three people own everything and we are all vassals of them. That's not a good thing, unless you're one of these two or three people, in which case it's great. Um, you know, it, it's there's so many ways this could go. That's why I emphasize, you know, all of this is us um, because these futures aren't written. And that's you know, why these decisions that we may, each and every one of us, matter. That's excellent. Um, uh, Dana has a question up above, which I don't know was answered. So I want to make sure that yep. uh, we have the opportunity to touch on that again. And, that, and the question was, how does AI differentiate trusted from untrusted data? <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's not going to be a single answer to that. Um, 
but I would say that, I mean, there's a concept in, in data science uh, known as a single source of truth, SST. And trusted data is data where you can trace the provenance of that data back to the single source of truth. Um, now, what counts as a single source of truth varies, and that's why these consensus networks are really important, right? What these consensus networks basically are is agreement on what the single source of truth is for some content network. So I'd say it's, you know, if I had to say in a word, what is trusted data? It's data that has provenance. Data where you know where it came from. And if you know where it came from, that pretty much answers all the questions you need to know about whether you can trust the data. In my view. Any other questions? We have a comment from Phil. Phil, do you, do you have any questions you'd like to ask as well? Because you've been commenting a lot. No, no, I'm just sitting here soaking it up and learning. I really do appreciate all the viewpoints and the points to ponder. Yeah. I like this, Phil's comment. It seems the society's economic system plays a big role. Until education does not cost, there will always be a need for instrumental learning. That seems to be true. My That's biggest fun. burning question is how to incorporate this as an educational tool to the benefits of the student experience. Mm. That's a big one. We don't have. <laughs> I mean, that's, yeah. And, you know, that's the sort of question people put in, in, in it's a roundabout way of saying, you know, this discussion should be more practical than theoretical. I, I hear that a lot. Oh, no, um, I love it. I love the philosophical no, aspects yeah. of it because it informs everything mm -hmm. else. But 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 it's interesting because when I hear that sentiment, often I interpret it as all of this new stuff is great, but how is it going to help me continue to do what I have been doing all along? And and that's often what people mean by practical. And even even when when people say, you know, how do how do we make it practical for our students? You know, uh, and we're, we're thinking about you know what sort of activities can we do in class, or uh, you know, or how can students use this to create assignments or or or, or tools or whatever? Uh, you know, could could woodworking students incorporate AI in their designs to build new interesting things, et cetera. Um, and my feeling about technology generally and this kind of technology in particular is that a lot of it means we're not doing these same old things the way we used to. Um, you know, it's sort of like, uh, you know, imagine all of a sudden I mean, suppose you're a woodworking instructor and, and, and you've got your, your shop and people come in and you teach them how to use the lathe. And imagine all of a sudden, everybody in the world got their own lathe and it's easy to use and it's not dangerous and they have their own supply of wood. Um, and, you know, it's not even messy. And then somebody says, well, how do I use this development in a practical way? Well, it's not gonna help your shop class anymore, right? Because everybody in the world has their own lathe that they can use. So you have to kind of redefine what it is that you're up to as a shop instructor. And, you know, if it's me, I'm thinking, oh, great, the entire world now can share in using a lathe to make neat things. I don't have to teach them anymore. What can I do, right? That's, and then you start thinking of things. But the second question is, and how do I get paid for it? Um, because they're not gonna pay to come into your shop class anymore because they don't need to. Um, so what do you do in today's society? Well, you might become a lathe influencer. 
I'm speaking a, a bit facetiously, but not that facetiously. A, a lot of people are doing exactly that sort of thing, right? Um, you know, instead of teaching lathe in a classroom, they become the person who does lathe on YouTube and gets several hundred thousand people following, and that's how they make their living. And it's completely different from what they were doing before. And that's the kind of imagination that we're going to need to bring to our environments when it comes to this new technology. It doesn't mean this is all gonna happen next year. And it's certainly not all gonna happen at once, but it is gonna happen. Um, you know, barring World War III or something like that, it is gonna happen um, where the, the sorts of things that, that we're doing now in college just won't apply because people can do these sorts of things at home almost for free. And that's the challenge. And Put Photoshop um, in the digital workstations for music brought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Justin Bieber. That's what they brought. Justin Bieber. <laughs> Well, let's go ahead and wrap that up. We're at um, 2.30 now. And thank you, Stephen, for coming on in and, and talking with us. Uh, uh, um, is there any one last question before we let Stephen go? Like a 30 second answer question? No, okay. Um, well, we'll go ahead and uh, wrap it up now. And that was really awesome. Thank you for um, speaking with us today and, and uh, and answering our questions. So. You're, you're very welcome. It was a total pleasure to be able to do this, and, and thanks a lot. So, Stephen, can uh, can we have you hang on just for a couple of minutes, and then uh, yeah. I just want to make sure that I um, get some information from you, so we can. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And I hope the audio works because I think the audio on my own side is broken. All right. <laughs> audio was fine, Stephen. You've been good throughout. And Bruce, we should stop recording now, and James as well. <laughs>